Flight School, Inspired to Fly, is a production of the Fairfax Network, a division of Fairfax County Public Schools. Flight School is produced in conjunction with the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. udvar Hazy Center, with a generous grant from FCA Nova, the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association, Northern Virginia Chapter. Three, two, one, ten. Hello and welcome to Flight School. Our classroom today is a Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. udvar Hazy Center. Our flight plan is simple. We'll learn about the amazing men and women of early powered flight, see their world changing accomplishments, and learn the important principles behind their early flying machines. We'll zero in on three very special airplanes and take your questions. Through it all, you'll meet historians, museum docents, and aviation professionals who have the knowledge to make flight school take off. Let's start the engines and meet two more members of our flight crew. Matt? Kate, behind me is one of the true rock stars of the golden age of flight, the Winnie Mae of Oklahoma. The Winnie Mae is a Lockheed Vega with a 500 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engine. Winnie Mae with her pilot Wiley Post achieved all kinds of incredible achievements during the golden age of flight. But at first I have a question for you to think about during the course of our program. What does the Winnie Mae, a pilot with one eye, pressure suits like you see the astronauts wearing, and an experiment that will make blood boil all have in common? We'll have the answer for you later in the program. For now, back over to you, Kate. Boiling blood? Ew. Okay, thanks, Matt. Now we go to Mark in Docent Mission Control. What's happening there, Mark? Kate, as you can see, it's like Pledge Week around here. Questions from students around the country have been coming in. Atlanta, Denver, Michigan, Washington, D.C., and even Virginia. Well, to answer those questions, we have our very own museum docents. Well, docents are volunteers, and these volunteers they have a very vast knowledge of aviation industry, of the aviation industry. And they're going to answer a lot of our questions. But if you're just tuning in, feel free to submit your questions by accessing our website, as you can see on the screen. And once you do that, it's back to you, Kate. Okay, Mark, thank you. Now, have you ever flown in an airplane? Well, today, airplane flight is commonplace, but for thousands of years, people thought only the gods could fly. We mortals could only dream of it. From the dawn of time, humans have wanted to fly. You see the dream in our mythology, our literature, our art. It was Leonardo da Vinci who took the first steps to make the dream a reality by diagramming heavier-than-air flying machines, helicopters, and parachutes. He spelled out many of the basic principles we use in flight today. But the first way people flew was much simpler than what da Vinci envisioned. Using the simple principle of buoyancy, the Montgolfi Air Brothers created the first hot air balloon, which rose into the skies in 1783. The gas inside the balloon was lighter than air. Thirty years later, Sir George Cayley picked up on da Vinci's principles and ignited the process that led directly to powered flight. Cayley was an engineer who conducted tests, gathered data, and applied that data to what became the first glider in history. The next great figure to further the dream of flight was Otto Lilienthal. Between 1890 and 1896, Lilienthal made 2,000 glides, created 18 different types of gliders, and became world famous. Pictures of Lilienthal gliding through the air inspired people all over the world, including two bicycle builders in Dayton, Ohio, named Wilbur and Orville Wright. Those brothers looked at how bicycles are controlled, and they looked at how birds fly. And with a great deal of experimentation and dedication, they found the secret, changed the world, and finally made the dream of flight come true. 
Joining us is Margie Natalie, a former teacher and a very accomplished pilot, as we can see by your jacket, Margie. <laughs> She, Margie's going to help us uh, talk about some of the things that the Wright brothers had to deal with as they invented their plane. Oftentimes in, when we talk about planes, the word aerodynamics keeps coming up. What is aerodynamics? Well, aerodynamics is a very big word for a very simple concept. Aerodynamics is the way air interacts with an object and the way the object interacts with the air. So the way the air hits an airplane or something like that. All right, so when a student goes out for recess, for example, and the wind hits the student, Aerodynamics is a study of how the wind hits that student, basically. Pretty much, and students aren't very aerodynamic. The wind kind of hits them full, full on. Uh -huh. And something like a plane would be because it has more of a narrow nose. It's, yes. Uh -huh. if you look at airplanes, and they're thinner in the front than they are in the back, and, and the air plays with that. They design them to be more aerodynamic. So speaking of planes, there are what's called the four forces of flight that the Wright brothers had to deal with. What are those forces? Yes, well, we talk about forces of flight and those are the forces that act upon the aircraft. We have lift that brings the aircraft up. Okay, so the air is coming under the plane and lifts it up. Mm -hmm. Yes, and obviously we need lift, otherwise we'd just be driving around on the ground. Mm -hmm. And weight pulls the aircraft down. So we need to balance the lift and weight so we stay in the air. Uh -huh. Then we have thrust, which brings the airplane forward. And drag is the force that opposes that thrust. It slows the aircraft down. Okay. It's the air on the wings and the um, fuselage and the old airplanes had the wires and that caused a lot of drag, well, held it back. Well, let me see if I have this right. So lift is what picks the plane up, the yes. wind coming underneath it, and then weight brings it down, and then thrust makes the plane go forward, as we see in our video there, and drag is what kind of slows the plane down. Those are the four forces. That's correct. You've got it, Kate. Okay, so when, when I'm sitting in the car in the passenger seat and I got my hand stuck out the window, I'm feeling, what, air, that's aerodynamics. That's aerodynamics. There's aerodynamics acting on your hand. Not very safe. Hang, <laughs> hang your <laughs> hand out the window, and I don't recommend it. Don't be doing but, it at home. Um, don't do it at home. But, but my drag, hand makes, but, makes yes. a drag. Yeah, and if you have your hand flat to the wind, you're going to feel more force pulling mm -hmm. your arm back. And if you turn your hand forward, you cut that drag. It'll Okay, and so the Wright brothers, when they made their plane, they really had to deal with all four of those for forces to make the plane go. That's right. Every... Everything that flies has to deal with the four forces of flight. All right. We're getting a lot of calls or a lot of uh, questions coming in from students around the country right now, and we're going to go check with Mark at Docent Mission Control to hear about that. Mark? Kate, we have several emails coming in, and they're very great. Um, let's go to McKinley from Denver, Colorado. And McKinley's asking, what kind of obstacles did the Wright brothers overcome building the first airplane? Well, McKinley, that's an excellent first question. The Wright brothers understood that in order to achieve powered flight, they were going to have to uh, have enough lift to overcome the weight of the airplane, thrust to move the airplane through the air, and um, they were also going to have to control the airplane. All of these were difficult problems and they worked very hard on them, but they understood that control was critical to achieving powered flight and it turned out to be the most difficult problem and took them the longest time to solve. Great. To learn more about the Wright brothers, we're actually going to pitch it to high school student Ariel Herman, who has this to offer. When it comes to Wilbur and Orville Wright, Dr. Tom Crouch pretty much knows everything. As a curator, he does lots of research, writes books, and is responsible for a vast collection of airplanes and other important aviation artifacts. He says most flying machines can trace their aeronautical beginnings to the Wright brothers. When they looked at the whole problem of the flying machine, they recognized that it really had three parts. You had to be able to build wings that would generate lift that would get you into the air. You had to have a propulsion system that would move you forward fast enough to get into the air. And once you were there, you had to have a way to control yourself. The Brothers' 1903 Wright Flyer is the world's first airplane. It hardly flew the length of a football field, but it was a powered, heavier-than-air, pilot-controlled airplane. They did it by solving one technical problem at a time. Control was the one area nobody had given very much thought to. The Wright Brothers, on the other hand, were bicycle builders and bicycle designers. And they said to themselves, you know, 
If you think about riding a bicycle, if you think about trying to explain it to say a Martian or someone who's never seen a bicycle, what? You want me to roll down a hill on these two little thin rubber things and I have to balance from side to side and there are these handlebars I have to manipulate and oh yeah, there are pedals I have to pump. You know, it would sound as though you had to be the world's greatest acrobat to ride this thing. But the Wright brothers knew that once you learned how to ride a bike, you internalized it and it became automatic. And they knew that the same thing would be true of an airplane. So Orville and Wilbur Wright did test flights with handmade kites and gliders over the sandy dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Focusing on control, it's as if the brothers imagined a flying machine like a flying bike. The control system became known as wing warping. You're flying along and you're struck by a wind gust, so this begins to happen. What you want to do is decrease the lift on this side, and that means turn the wingtip down a little bit to the air, and on this side, turn it up a little bit, increase the lift, so you come right back up like this. The Wright brothers were self-made engineers. You'll see that Orville is laying inside a cradle that goes around his hips. And to control wing warping, the lateral motion, he shifts his hips from side to side. And when he does that, he pulls wire through the airplane that puts the twist uh, into the wings. Right next to him, uh, you see the engine. They built the engine themselves. It only develops about 12 and a half horsepower. Not only does everything work, but it works in conjunction. Everything is connected. The machine is almost organic. The Wright brothers were just superb engineers. After the first flight of 1903, the Wright brothers would return to their home in Dayton, Ohio and perfect their amazing invention. Coming up, how far and how fast. Early flights test all kinds of limits and pressure suits to the rescue. But first, making a connection to aviation. Let's talk about how we control an airplane. Well, we do it through the three axes of flight. First, if we move an elevator on an airplane, it makes the nose of the plane pitch up and pitch down. If I move a rudder on an airplane, it makes the nose of the plane turn left and turn right. And if I make the ailerons go up and down on the wing of a plane, it makes the airplane roll left or roll right. That's the way we control an airplane. Those are the three axes of flight, and that's our connection to aviation. We're back now with flight enthusiast Paul uh, Glenshaw. And Paul, you brought with you a bike similar to the one the Bright, Bright Brothers used. That's right. And they, now the, the Bright Brothers made a plane that was very organic, synergistic, um, very together, but That's they right. solved problems, math problems in particular, one at a time. How did they use this bike to solve a math problem? Well, you have to imagine um, kind of unusual circumstances for solving a math problem in, involving riding down uh, West 7th Street in Dayton, Ohio with this bike with these a wheel in front of you and, and uh, big plates swinging around and trying to dodge the potholes and, and at the same time they're thinking about aerodynamics and, and angles and ratios and all sorts of things. Well, what are those steel plates used for? Well, just as you were talking about before, the four forces of flight, they were investigating lift and drag. And as Margie mentioned earlier, when you have your hand out the window and you feel that force against it, well, that's what this plate does. This is just a plain old flat rectangular plate that when they rode down the street was set at a 90 degree angle to the oncoming wind as they rode, rode along. And this plate created drag. Mm -hmm. And because it was mounted on a rotating wheel, it would rotate the wheel this way. Now, and I know you're gonna tell us what that plate is for, but how did they figure out how to do this? Did they have some type of a guide? Well, they absolutely did. What they were doing is they were actually at a point where they were having a lot of trouble. They, before they built the, the flyer, the powered flying machine, they built gliders. And their first two gliders did not fly very well at all. And they were working on data that had been mathematical 
numbers that had been put together about how wings work by other people. Now, I understand there's math tables that they yes. use, but I don't understand really what are math tables, Margie? Math tables. Well, back in the 1800s and early 1900s, we didn't have calculators and we didn't have computers. So in, rather than um, doing all the math yourself, you would go and use the research that someone else did. So people who were experimenting with different concepts and doing all of the math, would publish those as tables. Just like today, if you want to learn about chimpanzees, you don't go out and get a chimpanzee, you go look it up in an encyclopedia. So they use the math tables, but did those math tables, do they work? Were they okay? Well, the math tables were as good as far as they went, but the Wright brothers built gliders and the gliders didn't fly so well, so they started thinking there might be something wrong with these tables. We might need some more information, and that's what this experiment did. They built these plates, and this one uh -huh. measured uh, creates lift mm -hmm. and rotates the wheel this way. So what they were doing was recreating the experiment by Lenny, Otto Lilienthal to measure or balance the drag of the flat plate and the lift of the curved surface. And looking at those tables, it was all on the angle that this curved surface was set at. Tables told them, set it at five degrees, angle of attack, it's a very important angle. That's a math, that, another math yes, aspect. Yes, and the angle of attack is the angle where the Wind meets the wing. Uh, so if you're, if it's flying level, it's zero angle of attack. If you're flying straight up, it's 90. Mm -hmm. So they thought that at five degrees angle of attack, they'll balance. The wheel won't rotate. It'll hold steady. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't. It swung around. And that told them that there was something wrong. So they started increasing the angle of attack, and it wasn't until 18 degrees that it finally came to rest. And that's when they knew they had to get more information. So what did they do to get more information? Well, like I said before, you have to imagine them riding down the street and just as you do today, you have to dodge the potholes and everything else. So uh -huh. they needed an experiment that they could reproduce and run the same test over and over and over with different shaped wings. And so they built a wind tunnel. Oh, a wind tunnel. Yes. You know, we have some video of a wind tunnel uh, that may help explain what it is. That's exactly it. Well, what you see there is a little balance that they built inside a wooden box with a fan at one end, and the air flows through the box and flows over a little curved surface, just like I have here on the bike, and some flat plates, also like I have here on the bike. And when you take the paddle away, the air hits the balance and it rotates. Mm -hmm. If you block off the uh, air to the drag plates, it'll rotate the other way. And with this simple machine, the Wright brothers were able to build over 200 different wings. And they tried all sorts of different shapes, different sizes, different curves, and they started learning what makes a wing work. Okay, and what makes a wing work, they found out, was aspect ratio, Margie. Yes. <laughs> aspect ratio is, is one of the things about a wing, and I brought a couple of planes to help me explain aspect ratio. So I've got two planes here, and these have the identical size wings. They look just the same to you, don't they, Kate? Yes, they do. Well, well one's long and skinny, and one other one's, other one's short and fat. Right. One's long and skinny, one's short and fat. This wing is 8 inches long by 1 inch wide. So if I take length times width, I get 8 square inches. This one is 4 inches long by 2 inches wide. 4 times 2, 8 square inches. So they're the same size wing. So people thought they'd lift the same, but the Wright brothers discovered no, they don't. Because if I take eight and divide it by one, I get eight. If I take four and divide it by two, I get two. So the aspect ratio, that division problem, the answer is eight, the answer is two. High aspect ratio in slow speed aircraft is going to provide more lift than a low aspect ratio. So the Wright brothers knew that they had, they were given the tables about how big the wing had to be, but the Wright brothers figured out it had to be long and skinny instead of short and fat. That's exactly right. Okay. And this information led directly to their success in 1903, didn't it? And, then, and further success in 1905. Oh, it absolutely did. When they finished these tests, they built another glider that had the same surface area as their previous glider, but it flew 10 times better. Okay. And not only, so with the success of that glider, they could build a powered airplane, and with a powered airplane, they needed propellers, and the wind tunnel data worked for the propellers. It worked for all of the airplanes they ever built. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for oh, being with us. My pleasure. And now we're going to check down with Matt and see if that blood is boiling. Matt? 
Well, Kate, you know the old expression, a watched pot never boils. Well, the same can be said when you're trying to boil blood. But Kevin and Dick are getting everything squared away here, and we'll be up and running in just a couple minutes. It's going to be great. You're going to want to come back and catch it all. But for now, back over to you. All right. It's always good to hear about that experiment you're working on, Matt. Not far from the town of Warrington, Virginia, a former airline pilot is taking on the legacy of Orville and Wilbur Wright. Let's find out more. We've been to the Smithsonian and seen the original Wright Flyer. Now let's go see the Wright Experience, where all the action takes place at building authentic reproductions. Let's check it out. Ring warping is very sensitive. If you run your hand along the side, you can see the engine. Oh, that's amazing. Ken Hyde and his team at the Wright Experience are recreating airplanes designed by Orville and Wilbur Wright. Using a process called reverse engineering, the team is discovering the process of invention. It's a hands-on approach to history and aeronautics. They invented the propeller. Counter-rotating propellers, which was very, very much a... This reproduction of the 1911 Model B is controlled through wing warping. The propellers are in the back and the controls are in the front. So what does each control do? Does it make it go up, down? This is for roll control. <laughs> Aft is a right-hand turn. And you're looking at the end of the airplane at the rudder and you can see it's offset. It's automatically connected to the controls. So we're going to make a left-hand turn now. Going forward, you see the rudder moves in the opposite direction. Okay. Why don't you try it? All right. Okay, pull it back. That's it. You can see the wing move. Okay. Okay. And go all the way back with it. Keep pushing. <laughs> Push it back. Now you're going in a right-hand turn. Okay. Of course, it wasn't enough just to make flying machines. The Wright brothers wanted to sell them. And one of the first potential customers was the U.S. government. There were several requirements the brothers had to meet to make a sale, such as the need for two seats, one for the instructor, and the other for pilot and training. Now it's my turn to take the controls with instructor Paul Glenshaw. So we're not going to over control, okay? Mm -hmm. We'll just go for a ride. Picking up speed, we're at about 25 miles an hour now. We should be ready to lift off. And the airplane is starting to fly. That's great. As you can see, we've taken off. Now we'll stall at 24 miles an hour. So we are always trading off speed and altitude. Back the other way. Twist that handle up on top of the stick. And you'll see how the airplane turns. There you go. Turn it that back the other way. All right, right up. After a safe landing, time to see more of the workshop. Ken's team uses original parts, and when that's not possible, they use similar materials and methods. Craig, this is Ariel. Hi. Hi, Ariel. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. By comparing notes, conducting tests, and successfully flying their airplanes, the right experience really comes to life. Discovering the process of invention is discovering a little of the past and a means to explore the future. It looks really heavy. But... It does. <laughs> Still to come, taking the controls with Major Lewis, finding the right answers to your questions. But up next, it's not magic, it's math. Today I'm going to be using the lift equation to solve for the coefficient of lift for one of my favorite aircrafts, the Curtis Warhawk P-40E. We're going to start with the lift equation. The lift is equal to the coefficient of lift, which we solve for times the wing area, times the density of air, times the velocity of the aircraft squared, divided by two. And we know that at takeoff, the lift is equal to 8,810 pounds. The density of air is 0 0.745 pounds per feet cubed. The wing area is given as 235.94 feet squared, and the velocity is given as 100 miles per hour at takeoff, and we have to convert that to feet. Now that we know our values, we can plug them into our lift equation and find out the coefficient of lift.
And now that we know the coefficient of lift for the Curtis Warhawk P40E, we can calculate the lift at any altitude given that we know the density of air and the velocity of the aircraft at that altitude. So there you have it, it's not rocket science. Well, maybe it is, but if I can do it, you can do it too. That is pretty impressive, Margie. It's very impressive. But you know, the Wright brothers didn't have more than a high school education. So, so uh, students today, should they be taking more math and science courses? Certainly, you should always take all the classes you can and practice what you learn. And you don't need to be good at math or even like math. You just have to know how to use math so you can solve some of those problems just like the Wright brothers solved their problems using math and they were just very persistent. So take those classes, take those math classes, and be persistent with it. That's right. All right, now we're gonna go down and uh, I understand more questions are coming in from students around the country, and we're gonna check with Mark at Docent Mission Control. Mark? Kate, it's amazing the amount of emails that have been coming in. And the next one is coming from Nick from Suwannee, Georgia. And Nick is wondering, why did early airplanes have four wings and later planes have two wings? How did it change the plane? Good question, Nick. Think of this as, as two wing sets, a high wing set and a low wing set, each with two parts. They were tied together with struts and wires for strength, and by having two wings, we, we thought at the time we could increase the lift. What happens is we also increase what's known as drag, and that's why we ultimately went to two wings, because as, as structures became stronger, we could make larger single wings and eliminate the top wing and, and in, increase the speed of the aircraft. Um, Margie and Kate, do you all have anything else to add to that? Well, thank you, Mark. You know, there's a, there's a lot about uh, planes that could be added to that, Margie. There is. And you know, there is a World War I uh, plane here in uh, the museum here that's called the Cadrone, and that came after the Wright Brothers Flyer. Can you tell us about that? Yes, well, the Cadrone's a very early aircraft, uh, World War I, and it's uh, bi-wing aircraft, as you can see in the picture, it's a twin engine, it still uses wing warping, and it's built on that box construction, a lot of drag with all of those wires, but it was used as a reconnaissance aircraft, and it was used as a fighting aircraft, and as a bomber. You actually had to throw the bombs out yourself. So it's a very interesting aircraft. And the plane design was somewhat different. It was improved from what the Wright Brothers Flyer had. Well, it was, it was changed from the Wright Flyers. The Wright Flyer had the propellers in the back and pushed the airplane through the sky. The Cadron has the propellers in the front and it pulls the airplane through the sky. That was a, a little bit of a difference there. And it's bigger and heavier and aircraft had developed more. Well, you said that actually there were bombs inside and that causes a lot of weight. So they had to get enough lift well, to lift it up. Yes, they actually had two people in the plane which caused a lot more weight than the bombs. They were little very small bombs, but you did have to carry more weight, so you had larger wings, you had larger power plant. It had two engines on it, and that makes a big difference. All right. Thank you, Margie. Well, now we're going to go to Matt, and we're going to, uh, he has a story now that we're going to hear about, about planes and pilot skills that have evolved a great deal since Orville Wright's time. Matt? When World War I began in 1914, the airplane was more a novelty than an instrument of war. Flying at 60 miles an hour, planes were used to scout enemy lines and take pictures of advancing armies. But as soon as someone figured out how to rig machine guns and bombs to aircraft, planes became fighters. Throughout the war, there would be an increasing demand for faster planes and skilled pilots. But when the Great War finally ended in 1918, there was a surplus of airplanes, and former pilots now took their skills to the countryside. They created flying circuses with willing assistance. Known as barnstormers, these aerial acrobats flew over farms and fields, twisting, diving, and twirling through the air. Barnstormers sparked the imagination of young and old alike, including Bessie Coleman, who wanted to fly so badly she left her own country because no one would teach an African-American woman to fly. She obtained her flying license in France and returned to start her own flying troupe. By the late 1920s, pilots and planes were bound to race, to be the first, the first to cross countries, continents, and oceans. When Charles Lindbergh took off from New York in 1927, he hoped to win a $25,000 prize by being the first pilot to fly solo, nonstop, from New York to Paris. As the spirit of St. Louis landed, thousands greeted him. 
Not long after, Amelia Earhart would also capture the imagination of adoring fans, the first woman ever to succeed a solo transatlantic crossing. She received many awards during her all too brief career, including the Distinguished Flying Cross. Men and women created the golden age of aviation when planes truly went faster and further than ever before. It was an exciting time, and it was Wiley Post, the one-eyed pilot from Oklahoma who was leading the way in aviation in the early 30s. Now, Wiley knew that people had gone around the world before, but he knew it could be done a little bit faster. He predicted he could do it in, uh, let's say, under 10 days. And when, with his co-pilot, Harold Gaddy, they both got in the Winnie Mae, took off from New York, and headed east. They headed out and had to make 14 stops on their first trip around the world, completing that round the world jaunt in just eight days and 15 hours. Ticker tape parade down Broadway met them upon their return. Now Wiley also knew he could probably do it a little bit faster once again if he did it by himself. So up again he went, solo this time, only having to stop 11 times and completed the flight in seven days, 18 hours, bettering his record for a little less than a day. Wiley also knew that to get up higher and faster, he'd have to develop some kind of a pressured suit that would protect him from the elements when he was high aloft. And so, with help from B.F. Goodrich, they designed an early pressure suit that allowed him to go higher and farther than ever before. And when it came time to retire the Winnie Mae, Congress knew that the only place for her to go was here to the Smithsonian Museum. And when you look at the Winnie Mae on her fuselage, these great achievements are listed in order as they happened with Wiley Post. On the bottom, Los Angeles to Cleveland in substratosphere at 340 miles per hour. That's a lot faster than this plane could fly on its own. And that tells us that he got it up there in the substratosphere, got in the jet stream, and was cruising at a very fast rate. Gavin Dick, now he had to have a pressurized suit up there, or, or what would have happened to him? Well, he wouldn't have had enough oxygen, would he? Not enough oxygen, and what else? Well, you know, as we get up higher up in the atmosphere, and he's up around 30, 40,000 feet, we find that due to that lower atmospheric pressure up there, and as Kevin mentioned, we have less oxygen, but also we have less pressure that can affect other things in our body besides just breathing. And we're gonna do a little experiment to look at that. But first, let's get back down to Earth here, and let's talk about what it's like here on Earth. Well, you know, we talk about atmospheric pressure and pressure on us here on Earth. How much pressure, Kevin, do you think there is here on Earth? Well, it doesn't feel like much. It doesn't feel like much at all, does it? No. But, you know, if I take this little square inch here that we have, and I ask you to take this weight. Gee. Wow, that's oh, heavy. It is. And what? And on, if I, on every square inch on we have here on Earth, there's that much weight pushing down on us, 15 pounds per square inch. So on our liquid we have in the jar here, our simulated little cockpit, we have 15 pounds per square inch pushing down on us here. For every inch? Wow. So we want to take a little experiment now. Let, let's, take, let's take away that 15 pounds per square inch, and we're going to start removing pressure from us by taking out air molecules from this jar to simulate climbing up an altitude like we're leaving the, the Earth here. So as our plane takes off and we start flying up, we go higher and higher. We get up around 10,000 feet, going up to 20,000 feet. As you mentioned, less oxygen is available. And then we start going above 20,000 feet to 30,000 feet. Wiley Post would have needed some extra oxygen to breathe so he wouldn't lose consciousness. And then as he gets up to 30 to 40,000 feet, he'd want some pressure in that suit in order to push that oxygen and make sure that he breathes well enough. And then around 50 to 60,000 feet, what happens? Looks like it's boiling. Yeah, the liquid in his body, if you're up around 63,000 feet, your body temperature gives that liquid enough energy to actually boil. And, you know, that's all because of that reduced pressure. Well, let's bring us back down here to Earth, and let's just talk a little bit about what we see here. I'm going to let air pressure back in this container, back in our cabin, so we'll simulate coming back down here to Earth. Now, that liquid was boiling. It's, it's got to be hot now, doesn't I'll it? I'll tell you. It's not I sure don't want to touch it. Let's let Kevin. Sure let's you do. Like, come on, come I think on, we'll Kevin. Let Kevin find Kevin out. Kevin will do it. Come all on. All right. Oh, it's not hot at all. Not. It's room temperature. Oh, well, gee, why could that be? I don't know. Yep. Yeah, well, I'll tell you. What happened here is that instead of heating up the molecules and letting them move faster to boil, we removed that 15 pounds per square inch pressure from the top of that liquid, and now that air molecules inside that liquid, all that stuff just started bubbling up and coming out of solution. So again, pressure suits like Wiley Post created back in 1935 had to solve two problems. Provide oxygen to breathe so he wouldn't pass out, and also provide pressure so that your liquid 
in your body doesn't boil and also provide pressure to push that oxygen into your lungs so you can stay oxygenated and so you can breathe well at high altitudes. Well, you know, the stuff that Wiley posted in 1935, we see nowadays in our current uh, space suits that we have now, we have a launch recovery suit here used for taking off in the space shuttle. And we also have a space suit called the, the extra, uh, extra Mobility Unit here, our white one, that we use in the space shuttle and also on the International Space Station. When they're outside doing work outside in the atmosphere, that's what they're using to stay pressurized. Now that's pressure suit. You feel it, it's just a normal fabric. How, how does it work? Well, the pressure suit works in a manner in which, if you look at this, I can show you pretty simply. There's a rubber bladder, just like you mentioned with Wiley Post. B.F. Goodrich developed a rubber bladder for Wiley Post. There's a rubber bladder here that holds the pressure and maintains that pressure that's fed into here and also maintains that oxygen flow in the system. And then this garment on the outside actually maintains the shape of the pressure, uh, the shape of your suit so it doesn't just balloon out as you start to add pressure and you're being held by that rubber bladder. And this same technology we lose in the launch and recovery suit worn by our astronauts taking off and landing in the space shuttle is the same type of thing that's incorporated into the spacesuit here that we have when they're working outside the International Space Station or they're going up for a spacewalk. That same technology, the rubber bladder and the protection, the big difference here with the white suit, which we'll talk about in future segments of the show, is that this white suit also is made of Kevlar. And the Kevlar in the white suit is used as a protection device to stop little micrometeorites from penetrating the suit because you never want to break that rubber bladder seal because then you would lose your pressure, you lose your oxygen, and the problems we saw here in our experiment would all of a sudden be for real again. Yikes. So along with supplying the pressure, that outside spacesuit almost has, it's almost like armor for the astronaut. It is. It, it provides that protection, both physical protection like armor, as well as that thing to hold the pressure, hold that oxygen in. And also in the suit like the astronaut uses, there's also what's called a liquid cooling garment that actually also controls your temperature. That's the other thing when you're in space you have to control. Just like uh, Wiley Post when he flew in the Winnie May had to wear very heavy clothes to stay warm because as you climb up an altitude besides for the pressure and the oxygen becoming less, your temperature goes down. So now when you watch the astronauts get on and off the space shuttle in their orange suits, Think of Wiley Post. He's the man that made it all possible. Well, we've learned an awful lot from Wiley and the other pilots of his generation, but now let's listen to some pilots of today. Let me show you what's inside the cockpit. This is a cockpit of a C-20 uh, United States Air Force airplane, and I'd like to show you some of the controls that you would uh, typically see. Starting with the yoke. The yoke is used to uh, fly the aircraft if you were to push the yoke forward, the aircraft would descend. If you were to pull back on the yoke, the aircraft would climb, turn it left, then the airplane would turn to the left based on aileron movement and the same way with turning it to the right. So from the yoke to the approach plate, this is a typical approach plate that you would see in the aircraft and uh, it tells you all the directions in regards to taking this airplane off from the uh, runway that it's located on. You have the throttles, which are used to advance the power on the engine. And if you push the throttles up, the, uh, the engines will accelerate. If you pull them back, the engines will decelerate. In front of me, you have some of the controls, uh, dials that you can use to, uh, to fly the aircraft. For example, the, the speed of the aircraft is indicated right here, and the altitude is indicated right here. What inspired me to become a pilot was growing up in Oklahoma City. Uh, I lived fairly close to Tinker Air Force Base and I used to watch military aircraft just like this one come in and fly and land at the base. And one day I told my dad I wanted to build an airplane and I went in the backyard and I started building an airplane over the course of three or four days and the airplane never flew but it definitely inspired me and on the day I graduated from pilot training my dad pinned my wings on my chest and he told me that I'd finally uh, reached my dream. In the background behind me is the coolest bird around, the SR-71. She's known as the spy in the sky. Talking with me about her experience as a commander of a different kind of surveillance vehicle is Rebecca Cowan Hirsch. Thanks for joining us, Rebecca. Thank you, Ariel. It's good to be here. So, can you tell us, how did your work as a pilot support the Apollo program? So much like the spy in the sky, we were the eye in the sky. When the Apollo missions were flying and now the satellite missions are flying, 
Our aircraft provided that vision in between the land masses over broad ocean areas, collecting the telemetry from the orbital vehicles. So telemetry, for the students who don't know, can you tell us a little more about what that is? Telemetry is much like television. While television is video over a distance, telemetry is data measured over a distance. How did your work in middle and high school prepare you for all the missions that you do on Career Today? It opened up a thirst for knowledge. I took a lot of science classes, a lot of math classes. As I headed towards my engineering degree, ultimately, that led me into a more technical field that opened new opportunities, specifically in aviation and experimental flight test engineering. And finally, what advice do you have for a student like myself interested in breaking into the aviation industry? Don't be afraid to try new things. While science and technology opens opportunities and opens doors, it really is a, an adventurous spirit. Don't be afraid to fail, because failure just allows you to understand more about your strengths. Thank you. Thank you. Great words from Rebecca Cowan Hirsch. Back to you at the Enterprise Deck at the Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia. Thank you, Ariel. Now, Margie, wrapping up, what really good lessons can we take away from the men and women of early powered flight? Well, what the Wright brothers taught us is that we need to keep track of what we're doing. We need to take data. We need to learn from our successes and more importantly, learn from our mistakes because that's what we learn from. Makes sense to me. Well, when the dream of flight became a reality, the possibilities of air travel became endless, inspiring generations to explore and discover. Thank you for joining us on this first edition of Flight School. Don't forget to visit our website at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network slash Flight School. You'll find many of the answers to your questions and super resources for further studies in aviation. Thank you, Margie, for being with us today. Thanks, Kate. And thank you for being here also. As we leave now, we go one last time to Mark at Docent Mission Control. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Kate Sullivan. Great job, Kate. And now we're going to go to Stephanie from Livonia, Michigan. And she's asking, how much runway do you need to land? Well, Mark, that uh, all depends on such things as the weight of the airplane, the uh, speed it's landing at, and uh, the runway conditions and things like that. Typically for like a small airplane, it could be like 500 feet or so. But on a big airliner, it could be 5,000 feet or more. On a carrier with a tail hook, you can land an airplane in 345 feet. Wow, now that's great. Let's quickly go over here to Bill, and I think he has one from Susie, and she's also from Livonia, Michigan, and she's asking, how long does it take to get your pilot's license? Well, when I was in the military, it took about a year's training, but we go over a lot more things. In the civilian side of the house, you have to go to ground school and have flight training. In flight training, a minimum of 40 hours. Average person takes about 60 hours, but proof of the pudding is when your instructor lets you solo. Great.